Guess how long it's been since the last human went to the moon? Would you think it's been one year? Maybe five years? Believe it or not, the last time anyone went to the moon was 50 years ago. The United States launched six manned missions from 1969 to 1972, but nobody has been back to the moon ever since. In fact, the US is the only country to have ever succeeded at putting a man on the moon. So was US rocket technology just significantly ahead of its time? Or perhaps the moon landing never happened at all? It's actually neither of those things. The moon landing definitely happened. And the Saturn V was designed to rely primarily on the existing technology of the time. So why hasn't anyone gone back to the moon since 1972? My previous video covers the moon and Mars in terms of human habitability. But today, we'll talk about the rocket technology required to actually get there and how it's changed over the years. By the end of this video, you'll know why we went to the moon, why we stopped going, and what changes have happened in modern rocketry that will enable us to get to Mars. I'm Will, and this is Mars Matters. Mars Matters. Don't forget to like and subscribe. For hundreds of generations, we've looked to the night sky and wonder. Our remote ancestors could only explore the cosmos with their eyes and their imaginations, so the moon and planets were often associated with the gods, being divine in both their inaccessibility as well as their significance. Modern technology hasn't done much to change our perception of their significance, but it's certainly made them more accessible. Before the invention of the telescope, the moon was thought to be a perfect sphere, as was believed to be true of all celestial objects. But in the 1600s, the moon became a little less heavenly, when Galileo's observations revealed instead a diverse landscape of mountains and craters. News that the moon had a similar topography to Earth quickly spread, and speculation began about what life might exist there. By the 1800s, astronomers could view surface features of Mars as well, with some even believing they could see evidence of an alien civilization. People became fascinated with the idea of life on Mars. However, the thought of leaving Earth was only a distant fantasy. It wasn't until the 1900s that modern rocket technology began to emerge, with the United States launching the first liquid-fueled rocket in 1926. 18 years later, Germany was the first to send a rocket to space, and 17 years after that, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space. Not to be outdone by the Soviets, it was in that same year John F. Kennedy announced the ambitious goal of putting a man on the moon. Although he didn't live to see it, eight years later in July of 1969, Apollo 11 turned fantasy into reality when Neil Armstrong made this historic first step onto lunar soil. For the first time in history, sending humans to Mars felt possible. In fact, it seemed inevitable. As soon as the moon became achievable, Mars was also achievable in our minds. The future was bright. The impossible was becoming possible. Surely a spacefaring future was ahead of us. First stop moon, next stop Mars. We can spread life to the solar system. Nay, the galaxy. Build an empire to last thousands, millions of years. That's right, there is nothing we can't accomplish. The exploration of space will go ahead. Whether we join in it or not. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. But more than 50 years later, since the end of the Apollo program, we've yet to send even a single astronaut beyond low Earth orbit. So, what happened? In the mid-1900s, there was quite the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. And, as with all good rivalries between superpowers, it motivated the creation of powerful rockets. The race to the moon was simply another arena for Cold War competition, and a way each nation could demonstrate its technological superiority. NASA was formed in 1958 with this in mind, and received as much as 4.5% of the federal budget in the years preceding the moon landing. Neil Armstrong's one small step was indeed a great victory, but once the race was won, the cost of the Apollo program came back into focus. The Apollo program cost $25 billion, which was three times higher than was originally estimated by the Kennedy government. Adjusted for inflation, that's $200 billion in today's dollars. Space was sold to the public as a great adventure for all mankind. But the American public was split. There were many who dreamed optimistically of a spacefaring future, with trips to Mars just around the corner. 
But in a time of civil unrest and economic inequality, there were some who felt there wasn't adequate justification for spending so much money in space. From the government's perspective, the race was already won, so a little skepticism was all it took for them to find reasons to cancel future missions. Probes and rovers were cost-effective and less risky, so they were favored for lunar and Martian exploration, and human missions, well, they didn't make it beyond low Earth orbit for the next 50 years. So it wasn't a lack of technology or public interest that prevented us from getting to Mars. It was a government that cared more about political posturing than it did about science and exploration. The Cold War eventually thawed, and then innovation and rocket technology just stagnated. The strategic arms limitation talks meant that missile production, including those used for space travel, was drastically reduced, and a few big players in the rocket industry gobbled up the remaining launch contracts, and then sat on a monopoly with little incentive for innovation or change. Today's NASA receives less than half of 1% of the federal budget. So, is there any hope of getting back to the moon or onto Mars and fulfilling the dreams inspired by the moon landing over 50 years ago? One thing's clear, the cost of access to space needs to come down drastically. The 21st century heralds in a new age of space exploration, the commercial space age. Private companies like Elon Musk's SpaceX are working on innovative new rocket designs with an emphasis on reusability. These new rockets have already brought costs down dramatically, and future iterations of the technology promise to improve capability and reduce costs even further. So let's compare current rocket technology to the rocket that took us to the moon 50 years ago. For simplicity, all costs will be inflation adjusted to today's dollars. One launch of the Saturn V could send 49 tons of payload to the moon for $25,000 per kilogram. To the moon simply means the payload will arrive at the moon, but it won't necessarily be graceful. Landing softly on the moon requires additional propulsion to slow down, as well as landing gear. But for simplicity, it will ignore factors involved with the soft landing. Today's analog to the Saturn V is the Space Launch System, nicknamed SLS, which has been under development by NASA since 2011. Once operational, it'll be used to send astronauts back to the moon as part of the Artemis missions. Similar to the Saturn V, the most powerful variant of the SLS will be capable of sending 43 tons to the moon at a cost of $20,000 per kilogram, which is a 20% reduction in cost compared to the Saturn V. Although originally planned to launch in 2016, the SLS has been delayed at least six years so far and has seen excessive cost overruns. We need to do better if cost-effective access to space is the goal. But don't worry, commercial launch providers have the solution. On a cost per kilogram to the moon basis, some say the SLS will be obsolete on arrival. Since SpaceX's currently operational and partially reusable Falcon Heavy is already capable of sending payloads to the moon for only $10,000 per kilogram. This means that for the same cost, the Falcon Heavy can send two times more payload to the moon than the SLS. Supporters of the SLS point to its larger payload capacity and fairing volume as justification for the extra expense, since it will be able to transport large items in one piece. But SpaceX is currently developing a much larger rocket named Starship that will have 3.5 times the payload capacity of the SLS and aims to be fully and rapidly reusable. Full reusability means the whole rocket can be returned to Earth for reuse, and SpaceX's hope for rapid reusability is to have the rocket land, refuel, and be ready for relaunch in the same day. Conservative estimates for the cost of a Starship launch are only $100 million, with Elon Musk believing costs can eventually be brought down 50 times lower to only $2 million per launch. At this price, cargo could be sent to Mars for less than $200 per kilogram. But this is Elon we're talking about, so take that with a grain of salt. However, even with the $100 million price tag, and assuming a few extra launches per mission to refuel in low Earth orbit, Starship would be capable of sending 150 tons of cargo to the moon for only $2,000 per kilogram. In other words, compared to the SLS, Starship could send more than three times as much to the moon for one-tenth of the cost per kilogram, with room to reduce costs by another factor of 10 if a high rate of reusability is achieved. At these costs, unlike 50 years ago, lunar tourism and other activities actually begin to make economic sense, which has led to a resurgence of interest in returning to the moon. So, with all these advancements in rocket technology, are we finally ready to send humans to Mars?
For thousands of years, we only dreamed of the stars, but the moon landing proved us capable of traveling among them. Inspired, the Apollo generation hoped to see humans go to Mars and beyond in their lifetime, but the governments of the time failed to rise to the occasion. Today, we see private companies leading the charge, so we no longer have to rely on a political justification for investment in space. And thanks to commercial launch providers, access to space is less than half as expensive as it was in the 70s, with the potential for Starship to drop costs another 10 to 100 times lower than that. These low costs have given rise to a new space race, with various manned missions to Mars already on the drawing board. But getting to Mars is quite different from getting to the Moon. There will be technological challenges and health concerns entirely different from what was experienced during the Apollo missions. So can current technology get humans to Mars? And how much would it cost? Would humans even be able to survive the journey? And what does humanity have to gain from such an endeavor? You'll find answers to all these questions and more in my upcoming videos. So if you made it this far, consider subscribing to my channel. And as always, stay curious about Mars Matters.